thank you for coming. Uh, today I'll be talking about discriminative methods for unsupervised alignment of language with video. And we will be presenting this work in this year's NACL. So <clears throat> in computational linguistics, we are interested in looking at the meaning of language, what is the meaning of words or phrases, and one common, I mean, <coughs> I mean area is looking at the grounded meaning where the meaning of words or phrases, they are represented by what they refer to in the physical world. For example, like the meaning of common, I mean, normally the physical world is represented with images or videos, and say like common nouns could represent the objects in the world. If I say chair, the meaning of the chair can be lots of different images of chairs, and same for actions or action verbs. If I say run, we might represent it by several videos of different people running. And <clears throat> that's why recently there are growing interest in trying to connect language with um, computer vision or visual domain. And there are some practical applications, for example, human robot interaction, say like I want to I mean interact with the robot using natural language, give some command and let it do perform some actions, then it's really helpful if the robot knows how to ground these instructions into the real world. And recently there are much more growing interest in multimedia captioning and indexing and search. You might have seen there are many, many new papers where it's trying to automatically generate natural language captions from even some input images or videos. So in the system we will provide some image and it will automatically generate a natural language description of what's going on in the image. And there are some more in activity recognition using both visual and linguistic cues. <laughs> in this talk, I'll focus on a different application which is trying to model human activities in biological wet laboratories. So <clears throat> let me first talk about what a wet lab is. So this is a picture of wet lab. Should I dim the light or can you see? Okay, great. So, so this is like a bench top environment. So a person will stand here and there are lots of shelves containing different, I mean, re chemical reagents or different equipments. Normally it's called wet lab because most of the chemical uh, experiments, they involve dif different solutions or liquids. And in each experiment, there is a protocol, which is a step-by-step -step instructions specifying what are the tasks that has to be performed for the experiment. And this is written in natural language. So you can think of it it's like step one, step two, all the detailed instructions for the experiment. Now, now for the same protocol, if multiple people do the same experiment, they often have completely different results. And that is because that some, I mean, this was a study and it will be for from nature 2012. And they show that many of the experiment results vary a lot depending on the person. And it's perhaps because that uh, the protocols are often incomplete. There are many assumptions which are not spelled out explicitly and our question is can we automatically learn these implicit assumptions and identify anomalies given a i mean large number of natural language protocols and corresponding videos of some people performing the experiment so <clears throat> this is a much difficult problem so we start by trying to align these protocol sentences with corresponding video segments so the input to our system will be a protocol text, step-by-step -step natural language instructions for an experiment. And we will have multiple videos of people performing those experiments. And the question is, can we automatically learn the, or align different sentences with their corresponding uh, video activities or segments in the video where they're performing those tasks? So, I would just, I mean, in my view, I want to represent the existing work in connecting language with vision. And there are different domains of work, and there have been many work. I will just cite some sample of them. So one area is fully supervised, and 
since it's hard to provide all the supervision, people also look at me to supervise approaches. And <laughs> I'm interested in the unsupervised approach mainly. And I will explain like what I mean by this thing. So let's start with fully supervised. <coughs> in fully supervised domain, we assume that we have these videos and protocol text, and we have detailed supervision or annotation at both sentence level and word level. By sentence level annotation, I mean for each sentence, we have the segmentation and alignment that says that this segment corresponds to that segment in the video so for each sentence we have we already know a segment in the video where the action corresponding to sentence is going on and there will be also word level annotation for each sentence and corresponding video segments we will have a bunch of frames and corresponding sentence and we will have detailed annotation for each word and what it maps to in those images so you can imagine that it's very challenging to provide such detailed supervision because we have to first hand align the video and in each frame we have to annotate it explicitly. So due to that reason, I mean recently there has been lots of interest in wiki supervised approaches where people say that okay we will only have sentence level annotation. So for each sentence we will know the segment of the video where the activity is going on, but we will not provide it explicit annotation that water corresponds to this water container, bottle corresponds to this bottle. We do not want to provide it this explicit supervision and using latent variables. And if it's, I mean, if the system sees enough for example, it can automatically infer the meaning of these words. <coughs> and my interest is in more like unsupervised approach. The idea is that we will have just these step-by-step -step sentences and the video but no, not even sentence level annotation. And given the temporal structure, since people usually follow the instructions sequentially, given this, I mean, sequential structure in both the sequences, can we automatically learn these things using the latent variables? So that means we will have, in weekly supervised method, there are already latent variables for these different word meanings, and we will have more latent variables for the alignment of sentences to different video segments. <coughs> and the reason we a question that in the quite few assuming that the temporal sequence of the text relative to the video and vice versa, and was how fine grained does the correspondence have to be? Does it have some be some descriptors of state rather than action? We assume that each video segment that was generated from one of the sentences. So that means that multiple video segments would correspond to the same segment, I mean sentence, but I mean we will never have one video segment that aligns to two sentences. So because you could imagine that there are some cases in which there are uh, um, non descriptive ordering absolutely ordering. Both in terms of the video capture, if you do this, mm -hmm. and, and the sentence structure. Absolutely. I, I mean, and in the video, we actually see that sometimes people, I mean, don't always follow the strict monotonic order. They do some go, I mean, going back and forth. But it's so rare that when in our model, I will talk about it, like when we allow more flexible model in, I mean, which does not assume that everything is monotonic, that does not help us because it loses that constraint that actually helps it to learn the step-by-step -step instruction. And having more flexible model did not help perhaps because, I mean, one thing is it's very rare. People do not go back and forth that much. And the second thing are out of order execution. And the second thing is we do not have enough data to learn those rare out of order tasks. Basically, I mean, in this type of experiments, people are, I mean, experiences, people do follow the step-by-step -step instruction, and that is what is helping us. And there has been previous work in this domain, it's very similar to Parsinian's 2009 paper, where they did it in a different domain. They had weather reports in natural language, and they have corresponding database records for each of these weather reports, and they tried to map each words to corresponding database records based on these temporal constraints. 
So this is our model. We start with these protocols and step by step, uh, I mean, step by step protocols and the entire video. And then using latent variable modeling, we want to learn two things jointly. One is we learn the alignment of these sentences with video segment, and we also want to learn the alignment of different nouns with corresponding objects. So at first I'll just talk about the nouns and then I'll talk about the other things that we are trying to do. <clears throat> so, I mean, for that, we will start with our data pre-processing. We do some pre-processing and this work has been done by Yang and Chihuan on the computer vision side. We want to track each of the different objects in the video and we want to track both the hands of the person who is doing the experiment. And we have one strong assumption is we know the number of objects in the video a priori and we know their colors. We can get rid of that assumption, but that makes the vision processing a lot more complicated. So, and the accuracy goes down. So this is a simplification because our main focus is on the alignment, not on the computer vision side. So don't so, mind advance what kinds of uh, uh, chemicals are present. Like we don't know that there is a magnesium sulfate bottle. And, you know, no, that is what we are learning. Like we know that this magnesium sulfate is one object with some specific color. We track that by the leads of the bottle. So magnesium sulfate container had in our experiment a purple lead and we know this is a different object and we do not know that this is magnesium sulfate. We try to learn that in the process. So all the colors are distinctive, are they? Yes, okay. this is a simplification. All the colors are distinctive. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, from two, three frames, we train a, I mean, small number of frames, we train a Gaussian color model, but these are all simplifications. Uh, there are work in literature where people apply like clustering to automatically group these I mean, different colors and uh, I mean, do it completely in automated way, but we use it as a simplification. So after this process, we, after common filtering, we have tracks for both hands and each of the objects in the scene. And then we split the video into one second chunks and we identify in each frame, what are the objects that are touched by hand by applying a threshold on the distance between the hands and all the objects that we are tracking. Mm -hmm. So we know that in each video segment or chunk, what are the objects that are at hand? And we ignore the chunks where nothing is touched by hand. The assumption is that if nothing is in hand, then we are not doing something interesting. <clears throat> On the language side, it's much simpler. We take the protocol text and apply brown parser, and we extract all the parts and from each noun phrase, we extract all the head nouns. So if I have an instruction that plays the plastic board on the scale, I'll take the bar place, and I will in these two noun phrases, I'll take two head nouns. One is board and one is scale. And then you can think of it, this is our problem formulation. We have some n number of protocol text and for each of them, we have some video and we represent the text, each protocol XI, you can think of it as a sequence of sentences, which are the instructions in the protocol. And we do, I mean, only look at the nouns and verbs from each of these sentences. And from the video chunk, we just have these blocks. I mean, what are the blocks that are touched by hand, which we get from the tracking. <coughs> so, the idea is that we have a sequence of sentences, we have sequence of video segments, and we want to learn that which video segment corresponds to which sentences in the protocol. So this is our alignment variable. So X is our protocol sentence. Let's say for in this type of we have three sentences and we have four video segments. And this alignment vector, which is latent that we are trying to learn, HI, that tells us that the first video jump was generated from sentence one, second and third video jump was generated from sentence two, and the last video jump was generated from sentence three. And we do not have this supervision. We are trying to learn it automatically. These are our latent variables. <clears throat> so this is our 
entire work from last year to AI. And there we used a hierarchical generative model for doing two level alignments. So by two level alignments, I'm meaning that at the sentence to video level, and within each sentence, we are aligning the nouns with corresponding blocks. And you can think of it, this is a problem which is very similar to machine translation. Like in machine translation, we have, say, French sentences, and we want to translate that to English by looking at these examples, and we automatically learn what are the correspondence between different words in the two languages. Here, we have video and sentences, and we want to learn the correspondence between nouns and different blocks in the video. So <clears throat> this model has basically the sentence level alignment is done using the, the Markov model. You can think of it that these are our video segments, and here are our protocol sentences. Any box, if I grade, that means that that corresponding video chunk was generated from that sentence. So for example, if I make this grade, that means like the M video chunk was generated from the M segment. And we can think of like any configuration of these metrics as later variable, but we have some constraint, which is our alignment is monotonic. If I say that the M video chunk was aligned to the M sentence, the next video term, which is M plus one video term, that can either align to the current sentence or to the next sentence. So there is a strict assumption that people do tasks step by step following the protocol. Sometimes it, I mean, people do not follow it, but I mean, it helps to have this constraint in the model. So that was the HMN part, which does this sentence level alignment. Now, if I say that this sentence, I mean, this video segment was generated from this sentence, you can think of it that there are multiple nouns in that segment, and there are multiple blobs or objects in that video chunk. And we also want to learn the mapping between them. So if I have like bottle and water, these two nouns, and here I have the objects that correspond to the bottle and the water container, I want to learn their mapping, that bottle maps to the object representing bottle and water maps to the object representing the water container. <clears throat> and we do it using the IDM model one, which is a standard model for machine translation water alignment. So do you have any questions about this model? Are there complex nouns that you treat as single nouns? Uh, no, I think, I mean, there are months often multiple nouns, I mean, say like uh, calcium chloride, they mean the same thing. That's the color. Okay, I, but I mean, since we always take the head now, so the parser tells us that chloride is it's the chloride. chloride. <laughs> <laughs> that could be actually risky if we have <laughs> calcium chloride and magnesium chloride, but luckily in our protocol, we do not have that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I was thinking that one easy, because we, there have been different protocols written by different people. We had to do some like cleaning up. So sometimes people refer to calcium chloride as uh, calcium chloride, two words. And in some other protocols, people wrote it as like chemical signals, CaCl2. So it might be solved by representing it as CaCl2. Then it's basically calcium chloride. Is it the same for the adjective phrases? Like, I don't know purple bottle or something like that. Uh, yes, it? exactly, because purple bottle will be like fire. Uh, so now there have been some challenges. So one of the first challenges we saw that there has been many nouns that are not actually observed in the video because they're not physical objects, say like protocol or outside anything, these types of nouns, there have was no object that corresponds to that. So we added a latent variable. So for each round, there is a Boolean latent variable that if it's one, then it says that it is observed in the video or it's zero. And we want to learn that automatically. So for example, that, I mean, if we have some noun like protocol or outside in all the videos, they will not find something that is, that reasonably maps to it, no object. So eventually it learns that this is not present in the video itself. So let me show some experiments. These are, I mean, so far what I have been saying is our previous model. So we 
experiment, two experiments with 12 videos, and there have been three different protocols and four videos per protocol. On average, there were nine steps and 24 sentences, and the videos are not very long, roughly five minutes. Some protocols are short, they are like three to three minutes. Some protocols, one protocol was particularly very long. And <clears throat> we want to look at what is the error by our alignment algorithm and what is the error due to the computer vision tracking because there has been lots of error sometimes in tracking and the computer vision processing. And that's why we, on these 12 videos, we hand annotated the video for evaluation purpose and we run our alignment algorithm both on the, I mean, hand, hand tracking and the computer vision tracking. So here is the initial results. So HMM is our regular HMM, and latent HMM is where we have the <coughs> Boolean latent variables for uh, observation state of each of the noun. I mean, whether the noun is observed or not. And it seems like it's slightly improved the accuracy, but it's not really statistically significant. So one question <laughs> about the evaluation. So if you have like a bonding box or whatever for an object and you have the report, uh, like if it's like I don't know, you assign the position or the object like item but so I mean you can think of it that each object that is represented as a symbol so all the bottles that can be say blob a you can think of it as a word so then it's the idea model one is same as machine translation so we replace the I mean detected blobs by their correspond one of the symbols and then for segments that in reality don't really correspond to any of the sentences, do I have to just assume that every segment has to correspond to the That is the assumption, like every video segment has to map, it has to be generated from one of the sentences. So it's like, I mean, I mean there is, in machine translation, people have null words. So that represents that if some word in French was generated from, I mean, it's an additional word, we can represent that it is generated from null word. But we tried using null word and it did not really improve. So, so is there any different number of the percent? Or some previous uh, segments that are not really that much? Actually, I, I mean, when people did it correctly, I, I mean, I have not seen any example where some step that, I mean, does not map to just like anything. Sometimes it, it happens that one video segment, but it's true that it can be like, I can never reach 100% because sometimes one segment maps to two sentences. So say like people who have segments we usually, I mean, since we ignore every time, like if nothing is touched by hand, so oh, that is not yeah. not included in our right in the pre so pre processing. Pre -processing. Yeah. Are they all experienced uh, in terms of what the steps are? You don't have to reach for a piece of paper and look what the <laughs> next step is. Uh, in our experiments, we have we had it like in front of us, oh. like. <laughs> You know, it was like a computer, and when we tracked the objects, it was, I mean, we did not track the, track the computer, like where all the steps were written. So. One question, so what are your segments? They're like predefined pieces of videos, like for some reason. So who does the segmentation? You, like, I mean, so we do it like very simple course segmentation. Each video segment is one second chunk. And there is nothing intelligent there. It's just like one second chunk. And from that, then we look at what are the objects that are touched by hand in that segment. So sometimes it may happen that that one second is between two steps. So people may touch like two things, uh, multiple things which are between the boundary, but it's very rare because one second is really small time. And when people I mean, switch between steps, usually they take a break, like there is more gap between steps compared to the 
Because yeah. they take a break, they don't touch anything, and that makes you remove that, and then it comes. I mean, I mean, it's not that they do it like deliberately. It's like I mean, when you are doing one step, you are done with it. When you look at what is the next thing to do, so something like that. yeah. But there could be the cases where I mean, I mean, it's possible that the objects touched by hand they come from two different steps due to the way we are segmenting. But I think that is not like the main source of the error. So far, the main source of the error is that there are many objects which are very difficult to identify. Mm -hmm. So, and even though we make this assumption about the color, there are like lots of issues. Right? I mean, sometimes several objects have different shades of white, and the background is white, so it's very difficult to identify them. So those were the main. I mean, if we look at the source of the error, mostly we are struggling with the computer vision side. <clears throat> and so one limitation in this model is that we have only considered nouns. We did not look at the verbs or anything. And what we want to do is we want to incorporate verbs. And there can be two things that we can do with the verbs. One thing is there are co-occurrences of verbs with different objects. For example, when the protocol says write something on the bottle, then people use as the pen. So there is a clear correlation between the verb write and the pen object. Also, when there are aspirate, then people use pipette. And second thing, which is more difficult, but that is more interesting, is aligning verbs with actions. So in this work, we already, I mean, did some work with this, but now my focus is of the rest of the semester and summer to look at the mapping between verbs and actions, which is much more difficult. And the other thing is we can incorporate prepositions because if I say that put the plastic coat on the scale, then there is some assumption that there is a relation between the scale and the boat and hand location. And we can disambiguate some of the words and nouns that way. But when we try to do that, one challenge we face is that adding these types of relation is not easy in generative model because there the model is in a way that each of these correlations are competing with each other. So if I say that uh, pen was generated from, uh, sorry, if I say pipe was generated from the far aspirate, then it takes away some probability from it being generated from the noun pipe. So we don't want it to all add up to one. Instead, we want to have some overlapping features. And that's why we move towards the discriminative alignment. So in discriminative models, it's easier to use lots of complex and overlapping features because it's a like log linear model and the normalization is done globally. So, but in discriminative model, there is always the problem is formulated as a prediction task. So for example, in parts of speech tagging, given the sentence, we want to predict the parts of speech. So same way, we formulate our problem as trying to predict the video segments from the protocol sentences. So we have these inputs as protocol sentences and video sequences. The idea is that we want to predict, learn to predict this video from the protocol sentences where the alignment is unknown. It's like latent alignment. So this becomes a latent variable structure prediction. And we start with a latent CRF model. So if you look at the conditional probability distribution, this is the probability of the video given the protocol sentence. And we also have, I mean, how many video chunks, like we know the number of video segments. And then we try to predict the video given the number of video segments and the protocol sentences. And we use a very simple log linear model where phi is our feature function that defines these features over the space. So I think it will be clearer here. So this is our video segment. Say I have ni number of segments. This is our protocol sentence. And we are trying to predict the video on the protocol. And this gray shaded box does represent the alignment. So for example, it says that this, I mean, this video frame was generated from this sentence. This video segment was also, all these three segments were generated from the same sentence. 
And although we do not know exactly it's latent, but we try to learn it. And the feature function that depends on both the video and protocol filters and this alignment. So for example, one of our feature is the co-occurrence of nouns and blobs. So if you think of it, this is my alignment vector that says this yin maps to xim. So there is a feature that will trigger for the objects in this video segment with corresponding nouns in that sentence. Uh, I mean, since it's, we are doing exact inference using dynamic programming, I mean, Peter P. So even if we start and see some path to be more probable, but finally, when we finish our dynamic programming and reach here, we know what is the most probable path. And we always do exact inference even when we are trying to get the most probable alignment using Peter P, or we want to get the expected alignment using forward backward. So there, it's like exact dynamic programming. So here are the features. So we divide the features into two groups. One is the cooperance features, which is cooperance of nouns and blobs, which was very similar to our HMM model. But the new thing is we also have features for cooperances of parts and corresponding blobs. So you can think of it, this can capture that the blob or object then co-occurs with the now, sorry, verb right or pipette co occurs with the verb aspirate. And when we look at the learned parameters, we see that it learned like it gave positive weights to that. Also, we have some alignment path features. The first one is dump size. We want to learn what is the probability of either aligning the next video chunk to the current sentence or the next sentence. So, since we are looking at the monotonic alignment, the jump can be either zero or one. And we have some positional features. You can look at it as normalized distance from diagonal. So basically, it says that how far you are going in the alignment from the diagonal. And normally, we want to, since the overall assumption is mostly people take similar time per step. So it tries to keep it diagonally by learning the weights. But if some step takes longer, you can allow that. So <clears throat> I will just briefly talk about the learning of the parameters. So what are the parameters in the log linear model? We have a bunch of features, and the feature weights are our parameters. And we learn that by maximizing the conditional likelihood by statistic gradient descent. We update parameters for each video protocol pair and continue. And this is the gradient. <coughs> Actually, I mean, this is the full gradient, but you can ignore this sound because we are doing statistical gradient descent. We are using one sentence and video pair at a time. And I will just briefly explain what are these two expectations are. And I will explain it in the next slide. So the first term in that expectation, you can think of it is it's like a forced expectation. We assume that we know the video segments and we have observed the protocol sentences. What we haven't observed is the alignment because we do not know that. And we try to measure the expectation of this alignment given these two inputs. So this is done using just like standard forward backward. So we have this lattice and we observe these two things and we learn what is the expected features for that. But the second term is slightly more complicated because now we assume that we have not seen the video and we want to simultaneously predict the alignment and the video. So what is the expected features when we only saw the, so we only know the protocol sentences and the number of video segments and we want to generate some video here and we want to take an expectation over all possible video sequences and all possible alignment states. So you can imagine that it's computationally very expensive because here videos are represented as set of blocks. So we have to look at AI sequences of all possible subsets 
of blocks, right? So if we look at the computational complexity for night implementation, if I have total by is my set of unique blobs. So if that's my number of objects in the video, so it's exponential to the number of objects, which is computationally almost infeasible. So we do very two simple speed up ideas. The first one is very simple because even though we are looking at the subset of blobs, we are looking at only at the blobs that are touched by hand. And in any segment, we never see that more than two objects are touched by hand. So we can prune all the larger subsets. Actually, for to be safe, we just keep like all the subsets up to three, size three, and prune all the others. And we do some pre-computing using some, I mean, keeping intermediate states for dynamic programming. I wouldn't go into the details, but this significantly reduces our computational complexity. And now we can do that exact forward. I mean, <coughs> we can do forward backward. It's not completely exact because we are, but I think, I mean, it's almost exact because we never have more than three objects in hand. So overall, this is our complexity. And here are the results. We look at so these were previous HMM and latent HMM. And now with latent theory, we got significant improvement on manual tracking data, which is much cleaner data set. And on the computer vision data, we had very small improvement, which is not really statistically significant, but we had highly significant improvement of the tracking data set. So, I mean, do you have any questions at this point? Or I'll move on to some other algorithm. So <clears throat> basically, this was our CRF, latent CRF. In structure prediction, people use two other common algorithms. One is latent structure perceptron, which is a non probabilistic model. You can think of it that in latent CRF, we will replace all the sum with max, then it becomes like, I mean, the perceptron becomes almost similar to that because, I mean, instead of doing forward, backward, will be doing beta B. And if we have very large data set, normally structured perceptron converges faster in practice. And it has like, I and mean, it works usually as well as latent CRF. But normally, if we have smaller data set and we do not have enough information in those case, latent CRF is better because we are marginalizing over all the possible states. <coughs> So here is the weight update rule. Let's see. So every time after each iteration, the new weight will be the old weight plus some gradient factor, which is the feature vector for force decoding and subtracted by the feature vector for like the full decoding case. And here they are in, you can think of it, it's very similar to latent CRF. That's what we, in that case, the gradient was the difference of two expectations. And here, the gradient is between the two feature vectors because we are not taking expectations. We are only looking at the R max instead of sum. The first term is we assume that we know the correct video and we are taking the best alignment given our parameter. And here in the second term, we assume that we neither know the alignment nor the video and we try to get the best estimate of our video and the alignment vector and then we subtract the difference between them. So we are trying to go to the true true video features as much as possible. <clears throat> now, when we tried using it, we faced some challenges. The full decoding, here we want to take the best possible decoding of the video and the alignment. And this is really difficult task because although we know the total number of video segments, we do not know how many segments to assign per sentence. So there is no constraint on how many, at most, how many segments we can assign to each sentence. So what happens is the decoding often assigns too many segments to the same sentence. And the final decoding in bars, it's not very good. And then it tries to update the weights based on that. So it does not convert. So it was really like, I mean, it was working relatively worse. 
So we made two updates. First is we tried constraint for Subtron, where we said that, OK, it's very difficult to jointly learn the alignment and video. So what we will do is we will fix the alignment to the forced alignment that we obtained for force decoding. And then we will only try to find the best possible set of blobs given that alignment. Because alignment tells us how many video frames to generate per sentence. And then if we just generate that, then our there is a chance that we can improve the weight vectors. And that gave us better convergence property. And then we also tried a hybrid version. So where we start with the constraint perceptron, keep running in it, like we are using more conservative approach at the beginning. And after many iterations, we will switch to the full perceptron. So this is the hybrid version. It's like, but you can imagine that even if we have very good weights, there is no way to learn. I mean, you know how many video segments to generate per sentence. So it will never be same as the exact video. So it will always have this convergence issue. So I'm almost done with this part. We just, one more thing, we tried also the latent structure support vector machine, which is very similar to latent structure perceptron, except we have this regularization term and the loss function. And the optimization is all very similar. We will do the loss augmented decoding similar to VTRB and everything. And we also tried the constraint and hybrid variants for this. So let's look at the results. So this was our previous results. Then we tried using latent structure perceptron and latent FDM. And they gave it slightly better on the manual tracking, but they did worse on the auto tracking. And they were having this convergence issue. When we look at the constraint perceptron and FDM, they did slightly better than the non-unconstrained version on the manual tracking, also slightly better for auto tracking. And they had much better convergence behavior. Finally, among different perceptrons, the hybrid versions did the best, but they did not do as well as CRF. So in the end, CRF did the best. And I think it makes sense because it was, we do not have that much data. And CRF was taking expectation over all possible alignments. So it was, <coughs> I mean, kind of combining all the information that it has. So if I, I mean, in summary, this is like the take home message. So in our experiments, discriminative models did better than the previous generative models. And we could, I mean, right now, we incorporate only features to model bars with objects or blocks in the video. But I think, I mean, our next step is to also look at the some representation of action and look how they correlate with different bars and also other types of information. Once we have this discriminative model, it's easy to extend it because we can add more features. And among these different discriminative models, the latent CRF achieves the best accuracy. And we think there are two reasons for that. One is latent CRF is probabilistic and it, I mean, took expectation over all possible alignment states. And we did not have that many data. Maybe if we have more data, Perceptron and SVM could do better. And even though the standard Perceptron and SVM did not do that well, we saw that the hybrid variants and the constraint variants work better, and especially the hybrid variant was the best among all these. So, I mean, I will, I have some slides on the future direction, but before that, do you have any questions? Just wondering on the, on the problem of simultaneous estimation of the alignments and the reducing, you must have considered some kind of prior on the number of uh, segments per, per yes. uh, so like some kind of yes. gear shape prior. Yeah, I mean, I haven't tried the like, gear shape prior. What I tried is manually restricting that do not, it's kind of like beam that do not go too far from the diagonal. And also, like, I mean, tried, it slightly improved when I incorporated those diagonal features. So the alignment path feature that tries to penalize going away from mm -hmm. diagonal. 
So it's slightly improved, but the problem was still still. Mm -hmm. That was the problem. So if we have uh, like the larger data set, do you have any reason to think that it could run model better? Uh, I think so. so. Uh, <laughs> what are like the computational costs? So <clears throat> for latent CRF, the computational cost is almost asymptotically same as latent perceptron or latent SVM. Because in one case, we do forward backward. In other case, we do Peter B. So the, I mean, ego complexity is same. But there are some constant times more complexity for CRF. Because for CRF, you have to do first forward pass, then do backward pass, and then do like overall expectation. But in uh, in the perceptron, we just do one pass, look at the most best result, and we are done. And in, when we look at the, I mean, computation time, we see usually CRF takes two and a half times more, I mean, two and a half times slower compared to perceptron and SVM. So it's very similar. But asymptotically, I think it's same. And the reason why I think that it may perform better if we have more data is. <clears throat> Perceptron only looks at the best decoding, like max. So if you can think of that one blob, that in practice it may have correlation, high correlation with two different nouns, right? Or multiple things. There are different probabilities. But Perceptron will always look at the max and try to update the weights based on max. Now, in what happens in machine translation is if for one word, there are two different possibilities. In one sentence, it will take the max. But when there may be another sentence where that max word is not present, but the second best is present. So it also has some opportunity. When it sees many, many examples, it has this opportunity to learn the second best, third best probabilities. But if we have a small number of videos, we only try to learn the max one. So I think if we have more data, there is a chance. Another question. So, I was uh, thinking, how would one uh, analyze like your you know, results in terms of like is eighty five percent good? Is it that like how did your gold standard data look like in terms of like? I mean, we compared with some random baseline, but those are really bad. But I mean, that can be you can think of it as as a lower bound. But I do not have any good measurement of what could be the upper bound, like. If it's eighty-five percent, how good we could go? I mean, I I think like since we don't see many examples where one one sentence, I mean, one segment could belong to multiple sentences, so those are very rare. So I think we could go really high in from the model point of view, but there are still some issues of like, I mean. There are these unmentioned objects, and there are missing objects which are not detected by computer vision. And there are, like, I mean, <coughs> unobserved nouns, like nouns that do not appear in the video. We are trying to learn it by latent variables, but still, it's not as good if we had very clean data. So, was your goal standard like manually aligned? Uh, blocks with segments, okay. and like people seem to agree a lot on like uh, segment. Actually, we did not do. Basically, the gold standard was done by us, and we did not do any study of like what is the what is the like agreement between people on that. I think that might be a good idea. Like, I think that's a very good idea. We can have like multiple people label the same video hand segment, and then we see like. No. No, good Sorry, I was just following up on that. I thought maybe one can also potentially um, objectively judge whether what your automatic analysis produced corresponds to a correct execution of the protocol. Exactly. <laughs> right. right. Absolutely. I think that would be very interesting and also for validation. I was also thinking that after we align, 
we can I mean, maybe extract from each video segment, we can extract the key frame and we can show it to people and ask like how well that sentence explains what is in the image. Yeah, I mean, we already are doing a little bit of that, but we are choosing the bottle leaves to have different colors, but we didn't do that. I mean, even the colors, we did not choose in a very sophisticated way that the signal noise is different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, it's all, I mean, you know, you can, you can do stuff like that and you can get into it into the weeds, but I didn't think that was what we wanted to do. Would it help to know in advance what kinds of containers with what kinds of contents? Exist in the in that wet lab world, uh, mm -hmm. and that there's going to be a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between nouns and compound nouns in these objects. Do you mean like also based on the shape, shape of the bottles, or no? Uh, just having this advanced knowledge. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that would be. I mean, when what is actually in the world? I think it will be helpful, especially when we are going to work on the real, <coughs> real. Very com I mean, large number of complicated video because I have a very strong assumption, which is I know what are the number of objects and I know their color, but that is not going to work in real videos. And in that case, I think this knowledge would be very helpful, could be as a prior and it could guide us like what are the different clusters we need to represent these different blocks. Mm -hmm. um, so, in the HM model. So uh, the, my question was that you generate from a sentence to a sequence of video. And uh, so let's say the sentence is like, and like put the carbon on the, in the liquid or something like that. So you have uh, carbon and liquid because there are nouns. And so just look at it as a of order in the, the level of the right. right now, there is, if you can think of it as a bag of words, we have one verb and all the head nouns, and we have features that correspond to that. We do not have like, I mean, different types of relation or what are their orderings. So that could be another way, like if we have many complicated instructions where knowing that relation helps, I like think those cases have been easy. If you change the HMM configuration in a way that just put the nouns as a node and like then each, each noun 
generate the sequence of video, then did you have any experiment on that? You mean just one noun generates the video? Yeah, or one noun generated some sequence of another noun. Because there is no relation between that. I mean, you have liquid and, I don't know, <laughs> and carbon. There, are, there, is, there is no ordering, but I mean, I think that is what we are doing right now. So you can think of that we have two nouns, which is one noun is liquid, one noun is carbon, and we have a bunch of objects, that object A, B, C, and then the model is that say, I mean, in each sentence, so say I mean, this is one video segment, segment I, and this is one sentence, X, I, and these are the corresponding nouns. And now the question is that in each object was generated now model from one of these one of these nouns and there is no dependency on the ordering so we have this object it has some probability to generate a component c the block b also has some probability to generate from two of them and block c could also be generated from two of them with some probability and we are trying to learn that so. <coughs> So I'll just quickly say what is my future. Oh, sorry. Uh, just, uh, but uh, I just want to know if you think things about the solution adding to solution one. Yeah. 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 I think it's possible because when a person is waiting, he is not doing anything. And that means the next video segment, you can think of that, we can have three sentences. First sentence, second sentence is about weight, and third sentence is another task. And in the video, there will be some, no video corresponding to that weight. So if we allow it to jump, like right now in our HMM model, we say that, uh, let's see, so for each state, the next video segment could either generate from current sentence or the next sentence. But we can allow it having bigger jump set, right? I mean, we can have with some probability it could be generated from the sentence next to next sentence. Or would you even have a video sentence if you're not using your hands and just Right. I mean, yes, yes, you would. Because in fact, <laughs> we're just solved in the wait period between the prep for the next day. Oh, you mean he will have something in hand? Right, but that will be for the next stage. No, but, but, you, that will but you would have that sentence. I will have that sentence. Exactly. I think basically what it will learn is it will map that video segment to the next, next sentence. But it's not possible in the monotonic way. I mean, I can show you some. This is also another model which we tried. So there, the next video segment can be generated from either the next sentence or the next to next sentence. So what will happen is that he, this sentence is do something, this sentence is wait, and this sentence is doing the next step, and we will have some segment where he was doing the first step, and then in the next video segment, instead of waiting, probably he started doing the next task it will align to that. This model allows to do that, but when we tried applying it, it performed worse than the more constraint. So maybe with more data, it might work. So. My assumption, I, I mean, I, I cannot guarantee, but my understanding is we do not have many examples of going back and forth and allowing it to make more, uh, more I mean, flexible, movements takes away that constraint which is the monotonicity and that actually helps us to do the alignment a lot like that is a constraint which kind of guides it to map correct parts i mean correct nouns to correct blocks so Yes, that's possible. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. If we have many examples in the video, like many times people are waiting, then it will definitely help to have a separate state.
Okay, so the next thing I want to do is right now we have correlation between verbs and objects, but I want to know the correlation between verbs and actions. And the reason why it's taking much longer is main problem is doing unsupervised segmentation and clustering of actions is very difficult. There are many ways to do it, and it's often hierarchical. Like say, if there is action pour water in the bottle, it, it's not just one action. You can think of it with composed of multiple actions. It takes the water to the container, then pours it, and then puts it back. And our initial clustering learned only very small, small actions. And we now have to do some smarter clustering or some temporal clustering, which can actually learn those actions. That is my plan for the summer. To learn a dictionary of hand motion patterns and try to see how they map to different verbs. And also we can model the populations for spatial relations, which is quite difficult because we track the objects by their leads and the lead position is not always same as the object position. So like we, the lid could be on the table and the bottle is in hand, so it's more challenging. And the other thing we can do, we can try to detect anomalies. And also one thing I'm interested in is to other domains. There are many open data sets. But this task is not completely specific to wet lab domain. It's, you can think of it as very similar to cooking videos and recipes or movies where the movie screen plays, scripts. So and this algorithm could be applied to many different other applications with some definitely application specific tunings, but maybe interesting to see Absolutely, and people actually did that work. There is a work by Ben Tucker's group from 2008 where they had, like, I mean, seasons of TV series, like 20, I mean, 21 hour episodes from one season of Lost, and they had, uh, I mean, closed captions, like sub subtitles, and they had this speech, which is automatically detected from using speech recognition, and then they tried to align it. But, I mean, that was mainly based on the speech, and the speech recognizer does lots of mistakes, so they have lots of issues. And sometimes, like the speech does not always correspond to what is going on in the video. So I think like trying other visual component, like we can also think of it like we are doing now mapping from nouns to blocks. We could also map from character names to their faces. There are ways to extend it. <clears throat> I was just wondering whether your method of alignment and learning and so on, uh, somehow implicitly takes care of the persistence constraints so that an object stays in the same place as long as it's not being touched. Is that something that sort of just automatic falls out or that you impose as a constraint? Uh, <clears throat> I think our function is even more strict. Whenever it's not touched by hand, we just know it. Uh, and we can, uh, right, but I mean, if, if something is touched twice, then right. right, you pick it up and use it for something, set it down, then do a bunch of other things, then pick that up again. Yeah. Uh, it should be the same, a bit mm -hmm. kind of the same. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Is right. that somehow, does that fall out? <laughs> uh, I don't know if we use that young during tracking, we So right, I think basically we put the track of the position of that ball through the entire So once you don't have the color discrimination, it mm. might be good to know exactly. that you know, mm. it's the frame problem, right? right. Absolutely. Things, jump around spontaneously. Absolutely. Actually, yes, I think since we track using Kalman filtering, that is kind of already an assumption there because like, it does not expect big jumps between frames or big problems in this position. Yeah, but right now, we're not assuming that the ball is out of the screen. Right. So that's sort of okay. So, mm -hmm. so we, can always, we can always sort of track the ball. They're, they're always. Once 
those like for, for the current data sets that we have, the new data sets, they belong to the screen. So that's mm -hmm. what But the consumption is kind of hand behind your back. Like you're modeling all these actions. So one of the actions that the tech is doing is to take the bottom and leave the label. And then if you just use the artifice of like whenever somebody is going to identify it, to hold the damn bottle up to the camera. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and that you know that would take away a lot of the difficulty. And these things would work as well in, in the lab where you we have you know, all the bottles of black cap. That would definitely help, but I mean, when they were doing the data collection, Henry requested one or several things that was yeah. There actually was an idea that came out of the last year, two years ago, it was the first time to make up how we were going to do the collections. There was an idea of actually having like a portfolio. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Just the object. But then some of the uh, objects are really Still going to get some logic that is happening in the small. Plus, 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 you know, um, the lab people put mm -hmm. other things on there. Yeah. Because, because, yeah, we, yeah because we were actually going to do the actual experiments. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what they were saying it makes it complicated for washing things after the experiments. Um, are you are you using a test subject? Yes. <clears throat> so when that's applied to the ice cream chain object, you get a zero value. So how do you deal with that? I mean, it's a great question. That is a very challenging task. Um, we couldn't figure out any good solution. So for now, for all the bottles, we wrapped them by the papers. Mm -hmm. and then we, get, we get rid of that problem. That is a very good question. That is one of the main challenges we are going to face when we are going to work more seriously on the real data, but those are all of the class objects. Yeah, yeah. this challenge. It seems like, yeah, you have a lot of those objects in the web. Yeah. Well, they may not be transparent at all. They can be the publication, so what do we find? Mm -hmm. yes, I, mean, uh, I don't have a good understanding on the object side, but I think it's like the real data is going to be a lot more challenging. But the reason is the content is Right, exactly. That is one way to perspective. I mean, sometimes, like, you see, like, even though the test tube is. I mean, transparent, it has some green liquid, so that has some color. Thank you.